slides have very little time, so I'm going to zoom through some of these and just highlight the most important things that connect to what, what the topic for today is. Uh, and towards the end, what I've done is collated some of the early questions that are coming uh, from the people who attended today and kind of bunch them together into themes so I can kind of prepare slides to explain why we think what we think about those specific questions and how we think about answering them. Uh, so, the title of the talk is very simple, uh, Grassroots or AstroTurf, but that's a fundamental question most people ask, grassroots meaning something that grows naturally, organically from the ground, and of course you, you talk about GMOs and all of that, so grassroots is not really grassroots all the time, and AstroTurf of course is very topically what we're standing on today, it's something you just roll over and it looks great, uh, but once you fall on it, you really understand how harsh you can be, you're not prepared to fall on that, versus falling on soil and the other grass. So, how does the early stage compare when, you, when you're looking to answer this conundrum? Is something better because it grows up naturally, or is something better because it got laid out quickly and it serves the purpose it's supposed to until it's too late? That's a, that's a conundrum in early stage DC as well. Is it really something that's fundamentally needed to help you grow the right way, or is it something that is applied on top as a balm, as a sprinkle, just add the right polishing finish to whatever you're doing, whatever you're doing? So let's look at the slides that I have coming up in that context and see what we think towards the end of this uh, slide. So uh, quickly about us, uh, what is one for? Just to explain what we do. Uh, since 2016, we've launched a fund every year. Today we manage 800 crores across all four funds. Uh, that those are some of our companies, uh, like Mabel Shared, we were in the last two rounds open. But we might have used some of our companies, some of our products. Uh, this year's Better Place, Profit Aces, if you've seen Twitter copy on Facebook, that's the Profit Aces. A video channel. So we've done some very interesting things in the areas we invest in, and that's a broad overview of what we do. Right? We manage three strategies inside D14. Uh, rising is our early seed strategy. That's where we enter the first round of the company. Many, many times we're actually helping founders co-create the idea and spin them off into an actual company before they even begin. Uh, so rising helps us have the most flexibility, what we call the typical early stage. Our primary strategy, just to go back, sorry. Our primary strategy is still our main fund, and Tritidium is our latest strategy where we take our best companies and we try to follow them even later. I'll explain why as I go through the slides and why our strategy set is the way it is. Next. Uh, these are the five investment areas we uh, normally look at. 90% uh, of our investments are in these five typical areas. Uh, very quickly, direct to consumer, media and content, fintech, enterprise automation, and deep tech. Now, uh, there's a question actually coming up later as to why we pick these five areas. So I'll come to those specifics as I get to that slide. But just to show you the areas we invest in and how we develop DCs in every area we go up to. Next. And finally, of course, uh, this is a typical question most startups have to answer. So I thought it would be fun for us to answer this as well. Uh, most startups have to classify themselves as B2B or B2B to something else or B2C. Uh, there, there's a whole bunch of gray areas in the middle. Uh, we find those classifications restricting. We think those classifications are even more absurd when you apply them to an early stage fund because companies change channels so often and channel expertise so often. We fundamentally believe that as a fund, if our goal is to generate returns and help grow good companies, we have to be good at every channel. Any fund that comes out and says we're only this, we're only that, we only understand this, don't ask us about that, they're forcibly limiting their interest areas, they're forcibly limiting how they can help companies scale. We think that's not a good idea for a fund to forcibly restrict itself when, it, when its sole job is to make sure it understands the market well enough to help these companies scale. So we actually spend a lot of time building competencies in all the channels that open up in this country. Next. So uh, before I go into how early stage works, uh, actually in reality today, let's look at how does venture actually return money, right? Because what is this thing called venture? How does it work? Why are there so many billions of dollars coming to venture every year? And you'll pardon me, uh, take your permission, but I want to talk about two simple theories that drive all of venture capital returns anywhere in the world. Right? So this is a graph, uh, a very non-linear, highly, highly power law driven graph of the top VC back at tech exits from 2009 to 2015. I believe this data is going to be updated with the Uber IPO and so on. But anyone wants to guess which company is this big blue one the top on, the, on the full left? Facebook, right? Or Facebook. That is why Facebook is important to every single VC fund that built its career in the mid 2000s. Think about Anderson Horowitz, think about uh, uh, Axel, think about the dozens of small funds that came in, think about Eduardo Saver, think about, uh, of course, Zuckerberg. That is the biggest company in that cycle. 
And you would be lucky if you were a VC fund that was invested in even one of these, this outside of Facebook. But when you put yourself in the power law environment that actually determines how VC works today, it's almost shameful if you are here and not here. And that's why in the US there exists a concept called a top tier fund. A top tier fund basically can open up its books and show you it has one of these logos. And a really top tier fund, there are only five of them today in the US, most of them would have been in this. If they weren't, then it's casting their heads and some people have been fired because they missed that deal on that side. This is why VC is, out of, is as difficult as it is. This is why VC is so badly misunderstood. Because the math behind this is what we call a power law. That means it's, it's extremely non-linear. It's extremely hard to predict. The math is almost always discontinuous. And if some of you, I'm sure most of you are engineers, most of you know discontinuous math is the most absurd way to integrate functions ever. So that is the math that drives all of this. It's therefore impossible to model. And what you have to do is get very good at adjusting to the laws that determine this kind of environment. And we'll talk about those laws in the next slide. Like this. So let's do a simple thought experiment. Let's build our own VC fund. So say you and I get together and we say we're going to raise 100 rupees and we'll target 20 companies. So over the lifetime of our fund, if we are a 10 year fund, most VC funds are between 8 and 10 years old. On the uh, x axis, we have our 20 companies that we pick over the 10 years. Right? On the y axis, we have our expected investment return. We'll expect that some companies like the gray line, some companies on the left will do very well for us, and everyone here will do mediocre or okay. Right? And what we'll do is if we have 100 rupees, we're picking 20 companies, natural, we'll say we'll put 5 rupees per company. Right? But what, what actually happens in a good portfolio, if you're lucky, is the orange line. Your first one or two companies will be, hopefully, if you're lucky, over 10x returns, and your bottom four or five companies will give you almost no cash back. So you actually can't put five rupees per company. You'll make almost nothing back because you would have lost most of your money in those companies because more companies fail. So the lessons we learned are very simple. We perceive that everything will be simple, linear, easy to distribute. In reality, if you're lucky, okay, you might get a return that actually looks like this. And only few of the companies will make all your money. So you have to figure out how to decide who or which companies are going to be your winners. You're going to have to decide how you're going to figure out how to put more money in those winners before they're actually winners. And most importantly, you're going to have to figure out how to make sure so many don't fail. Because if this guy goes away, then you have nothing only pulling a portfolio. And this is why most VC funds are actually very bad at generating returns. Most VC funds don't return money, and most VC investments don't return money. So this is the actual math versus the perceived uh, version of what venture is supposed to do. And this is very interesting. This is very interestingly why most of us, when we're starting companies, find it so difficult to convince VCs that just give us a short run, what would you lose? This is some money, right? Because all of them are struggling with this. They don't know where to place you. They don't know how to place you in a place that they want to place you there. They don't know what's going to keep you there. They don't know how to decide if they want to give you more money to push you a little bit to the left or give you less money so someone else edges you up and they go to the left. That's why getting money in VC is really hard. So it's, it's hard for everyone. It's not just some fools who raise money sitting in a fancy office waiting for you to come there and take money. Everyone is struggling with the same crazy on in your math driving those returns. Right? And let's see how these returns are concentrated. Again, I'm sorry if I'm boring with graphs, but this will make a lot of sense as we go forward. On the x-axis again, we have how funds perform. Very simply, if you remember my, my example, we started a fund with 100 rupees. If we had a less than 1x fund, we, that means we didn't even return 100 rupees after 10 years. We actually lost money for our investors. They would have been better off putting their money in the bank account. But at least they would have got 78%. And if you got a really good fund, you would have returned more than 5x in 10 years. That means uh, the 100 rupees became 500 rupees. A 3x fund in 10 years is around a 22% IRR, so a 5x fund would be around 40-45%, which is very good. Those are, that is what a top tier fund returns, even in the US. And very simply, you would assume that as you get better and better as a fund, you would have a higher percentage of companies giving you more than 10x. Right? So the better fund you are, the more 10x companies you have. Right? But as an inverse of that, in spite of being a better fund, you will actually have more worse companies than the middling funds. Now the y-axis is the number of companies that lost money. So 
This is summarized, you might be a 5x fund, great, you made it. You made a lot more 10xers than the other guys, but you also had a lot more zeros than the other guys. That's how the math works when you look at both success and failure. So obviously everyone, every fund wants to be here. Every company wants to be in a fund that is tending towards this direction. But you have to get used to more failures as well if you want to be a 5x fund. Right? So finally, how, how does this work in reality? These are two independent studies and they both showed us the same thing. This is now companies, not funds. But 65% of all companies in this study return less than the money they actually put in. Only 1.1% did a 20 to 50x, and only 0.4% went over 50x. So if you put money in one company, this is the expected return of that company as it goes from public to public. And the same study here, this is around 50% of deals failed, less than 1x. But this also in reality, the data in the US will show you that those graphs are really how reality plays out. And that's why early stage funding is such a mystery. It's very hard to figure this out unless you know exactly what you're doing, and very, very few funds can claim. They know exactly what they're doing. This changes every cycle, it changes every decade. Today, one can argue it changes every three years because of the rate at which startups are moving and markets are evolving. So this is exactly the math that is driving all of our decisions in venture today. Right? So how large is venture? It's like I'll move through these quickly. Uh, last year in 2018, we broke the record of venture backed funding in the history of the planet. There were more than 15,000 transactions in the year. 174.6 billion was raised last year. We raised 250 billion dollars in VC in 2018 globally. Never in the world before has there been such a highly liquid market willing to take so much risk, such a large allocation just to venture capital. In fact, Q2 of 2018, VC's rate, VC-backed companies rate raised 70 billion dollars. That's a historical high. We've never seen that kind of funding before. I think Jewel was another company that raised money in that quarter. But this just goes to show you the kind of environment we're living in today. This is a highly liquid, highly risk taking environment. So we shouldn't be surprised so many unicorns are being created. Next slide. Uh, in terms of funds raising as well, how many venture capital funds are being raised? In 2018, we raised historically the highest amount of money, $78 billion in VC funds. However, fewer funds raised more money than earlier in history. So now what's happening is the funds that are actually performing are able to get more and more money into them and raise bigger and bigger funds. We are seeing a flight to quality. That means the best funds are getting all the money and slowly and slowly the worst funds are performing are being left out. Next. And of course, this is the, this is the most interesting thing. This is the soft bank effect. Late stage venture funding is growing much faster than early stage funding. More money is going to late stage and is coming to early stage. The casualty of a high liquidity environment is that that money wants to chase something that's already tending towards success. Even though it's more risk taking, it's actually less, less taking less risk. So the very interesting conundrum there, the data shows how that's playing. Next. And this is very interesting. These are the number of deals, but this is the amount of money. Although every year there are more early stage deals, like blue, the actual amount of money going to early stage compared to everything else is almost negligible. So what, what every fund's blog, every VC blog, when they write, they're trying to encourage you to start a company, raise money, come to them, send them an email. What they're actually doing is they're hedging their bets. They want you to come back to them only as you get less and less riskier. But if you do, you actually end up being less risky. There's no money rushing to get into you. And your, your hosts are open. Many other companies will tell you for sure this is happening in India as well. This year, we've already raised close to $6 billion as of July. We should comfortably raising another six to seven this year, and we should be beating last year's rates. So it's, it's becoming very interesting. More money, but less rounds in the early stage. More rounds, but less money in the early stage. Very interesting times. Very hard to get your get your head around this, right? And of course, this would not be happening if there weren't exits. Most people talk: Are there exits? Are people actually making money? Are these fools actually putting money? Are they getting their money back? But Again, 2018 was a historical high in terms of VC back exits. Most of those exits globally, globally were in IPOs. Tencent Music went IPO. A whole bunch of B2B companies like Zoom and so on have got IPO this year. Uh, we should expect more IPOs later this year. We should be an interesting one going live. So we, should, we see that more and more companies are actually getting cash out. And that's setting more and more people to be aware of how, many, how much money is being made in venture. So that's becoming a positive feedback loop. As more exits happen and more people make money, more money wants to rush back into venture with the hopes of making the same kind of return. This cycle is also increasing. 
we should see this spiral positively over 2019 as well. Next. And of course, this is no surprise. This is as of the last month in 2019. We now have, I think, 360 unicorns. Companies value over a billion dollars. There are 33 unicorns in India now. I'll show you a slide on that as well. Never in history before have there been so many private, large companies on the planet. What's happened is very interestingly, more and more money is confident that they'll be able to generate more returns by keeping the company private for longer. We let the dogs evolve on this news. This is proof that this is happening at scale. And the IPO, the path to IPO in the US is actually proving this to be correct. So very simply, I'll give you a simple example. In 1993, Infi went IPO. Uh, Infi had actually suboptimal IPO. They couldn't fill the entire book. But they went to list in NASDAQ in 99. They were trying to raise $700 million. They got their book filled up to $3.5 billion, almost five times more than what they were asking for. So even back then, there was so much demand for good companies coming to the market. What's happening today is that demand is getting more and more, but companies are taking longer and longer to come to the market. This is why you're seeing even sovereign funds and government uh, investment companies like Tamasek and so on, increasingly rushing to the private side and buying stakes in Swiggy's and Ola's and WeWorks and Ubers and so on because that pipeline is becoming harder and harder to come So this is proof of how much these companies have, have grown in value and this doesn't show any signs of abating in Next. And of course, a big sign of something happening in terms of a peak signal, meaning are we getting too hot, are we spiraling out of control, is when corporates start investing a little too much money in high risk areas like venture. So let's understand a simple rule about a big company. I gave you the Infi example. Infi is sitting on, I think, six and a half billion dollars of cash today. That means they're just sitting their account. They don't spend it. Apple is sitting at 140 billion dollars of cash. Again, they made far too much money in the last 20 years. That's why they're committing so much to the vision fund. They really have no other place to put it. So these corporations increasingly have become very, very large in terms of the cash they're holding on to. And the other rule about corporates is they hate paying dividends. If any of you own stocks, you'll see that in spite of companies showing profits and growth, their dividend yield is not really going up. They will make up any excuse to not give you that money back to shareholders. No matter how much you cry and tell them that you're sitting on far too much money, how much do they hate paying dividends? They hate they're paying dividends enough that they'll actually put that money into venture. And they'll convince all of us as shareholders that, yeah, that company is actually better served in these companies because there's some strategic value being accrued to us. And this is good for our long-term share value growth versus giving it back to the right now, because I'm not getting anything out of it. So when corporate VC peaks, it's usually a historical signal that a little too much cash, there's a little too much liquidity in the system, rates are all out of whack. But surprisingly, that's what we thought in 2016, that's what we thought in 2017, that's what we thought in 2018, it is showing no signs of slowing down. So you might look at this two years away and say, it happened in 2019, it happened in 2020, we really can't predict when this is going to peak and start falling off. But this just goes to show you that we are in a very strange and unforeseen time in the financial markets history all over the world. Next. And of course, just to show you how large and powerful the US is, I showed you the map of global VC. No surprise that the US map and the global map look so similar to each other. Most of the world's venture investments go to the US. Last year in 2018, they shattered all the historical records. 83 billion was in 2017, and there was 130 billion in 2018. Unbelievable. But that just goes to show you how powerful innovation and innovation ecosystem that countries become. And this is the part, this is the only target we should set as a country. Forget China, forget EU, forget Israel, forget all of them. The US is the only one showing us what venture looks like at scale. Because they have the whole system from seed to IPO. All that value being accrued. This chart shows you exactly how valuable that entire value system can become. Excellent. And finally, of course, where are we heading? More and more, you're seeing that Europe's role in global venture is going down. Europe is actually really far behind. The US is going to be fairly strong for the next decade. But increasingly, with China and India coming together and getting more and more attractive to put money into, we are slowly whittling away on Europe's share in, in the global VC market. This is something that's very interesting. The next decade is only going to come at the cost of Europe, not at the cost of any other region in the world. And India and China stand to benefit immensely. Next. How is India doing? That's a good segue to how we're doing. Next. 
These are very quick data points of how India is doing. I'll walk you through the most important ones. We are going to be doubling per capita income this, this decade. At the same time, smartphone penetration has gone up 7x. We went from 53 million smartphones in 2014 to 380 million in 2019. No other country in the world except China has grown this quickly in terms of smartphone penetration. Not, not Singapore, not Sweden, none of those small companies, they're smaller than some of our cities many of the time. No one has grown like this at scale. So this is a massive, massive decade for this country. In the same decade, from 2008 to 18, 10x growth in the number of internet users. We went from 52 million to 560 million. In four years, from 2015 to 2019, 3x, we now have 273 million digital buyers. That means 273 million people in India bought something digitally. And we skip all the big things, these are all big numbers, but here's something very close to home. All of you, most of you would have been around in 2014. We were, we were as a country, consuming only 86 MB per user per month of cellular data. This is sub Saharan rates. Why were we so low? We didn't have enough smartphones. There was not enough for us to do online. Most of the content on YouTube was American. We didn't have enough, uh, you know, we couldn't afford the fees. Metal was charging, I think I can remember, 650 rupees. For 250 GB, right? A 250 MB per month. I still know that plan. I'm very upset with that plan. But in 2014, most of us couldn't afford data. What's happened in 2019? We are now consuming 11 GB per user per month. Now the US is sub Saharan compared to us. The US is at 2.1 GB on average per user per month. The US pays on average $60 per GB. We pay 100 rupees per GB. Sometimes you pay, I think now we're paying even 23 rupees for the latest GO plan. So we went from, the joke is we went from playing 8-bit Mario to streaming Infinity Wars and 4K in just half a decade. No other country in the world has ever seen this kind of change before. And what, what has that meant for our everyday life? Okay, very interesting stats. In 2012, we were watching on average 2 minutes per person per day of online video. Today, in 2019, we are seeing 67 minutes per person per day on average of online video. So why are people spending time? Where is all that data being consumed? It's people entertaining themselves, people watching, people communicating, video calls, all those good things are finally done. Next. And the same time period, Aadhaar coverage is up 90%, UPI is now beaten MasterCard in India, Janda accounts, 350 million accounts, and all the business metrics, these are doing business, saving money on our, on our DBT, number of registered taxpayers, mutual fund AUM, everything has gone up 3x, 4x, 5x. So this has been a really interesting decade. All that money coming in now, it's getting easier and easier for that money to help good companies grow faster because the fundamentals are slowly being built and formalization is happening at a much higher pace. This is why today it's easier to build a company in India, it's easier to raise money more quickly, easier to get a larger market share that much faster. So this is the this, this combination of the business formalization and the consumer spike, that's the big opportunity in India over the next part, next decade. Uh, next. This is why we say India is at a convergence. Four big vectors have come together in the same decade to help us grow the way we have to, the way we deserve to grow for the next sessions. We are finally now a top five world economy. I'm happy to share. We beat the UK last year in terms of our GDP size in nominal terms. We should beat France this year as well. We'll be in the top five to 2.8 trillion, 2.9 trillion on exit terms this year. Japan and Germany are the only countries on our way to become number three. We'll be comfortably behind China and the US, very hard to catch up, but at least we'll be in the top three in the next decade. That's no longer the debate. Nowhere in the world you go, they will question India as an, as an economy, all those classifications of the sick, growing economy, all of that is gone. Everyone's just looking at India and saying, I wish we entered 10 years back. That's the only thing they'll tell you. So finally, we're in the top five. We should be the, we should be comfortably on our way to top three. Our enterprise market is also very interesting. Now, very interestingly, five out of the top ten and three out of the top five global IT companies are Indian. Something most of us don't know. The top five, the three Indian companies are Infi, uh, HCL, and PCS. What have they done? They've done something very interesting. In spite of their revenues, annual revenues, only 10% being contributed by the Indian market. That means 90% of their revenues come from outside India. So their local market support is almost negligible. In spite of that, they've become world-dominating companies. What they've done is they've played the arbitrage blame game beautifully. With low cost in India, but a very high quality talent pool, They've been able to perfect a global delivery model. They've been able to take over the entire world markets coming out of that. So what Trump's policies are doing in the US, they're actually helping us become more cost efficient. Now we have a very simple reason to give our US clients that we can't send more people to your offices because we're not getting visas. You pay us the same rates for the people staying in India. So our revenues are actually climbing. 
if you notice in three PCS, all of them, all of their stock prices are actually going up. So the more firm cuts down, the better it is for their margin. So what these enterprise companies have done is really in an atypical environment, built one of the strongest industries in the world coming out, coming out of coming out of India in IT. At the same time, they also trained four million people in IT. These are usually very high quality people. They've seen some global experience before. They build software in global environments for global clients. When they leave, when they start companies, it's no surprise that they come usually with better training than uh, employees in Australia, employees in the Middle East, employees in Latin, employees in Europe. So it's easier to grow much faster with more people because the IT companies have already, already done us a favor of training one generation of IT people up for us. Today with 4 million people in IT, we are the second largest IT talent base in the world. Only the US is bigger as 6.5 million people. But interestingly enough, out of the 6.5, 1 million are Indians, fully resident in the US. So the global Indian IT talent pool is 5 million people today. Whether they work together or not is anyone's guess, but at least in numbers, we are 5 million. And finally, of course, this piece would have been incomplete without the consumer install base. But like we shared, 560 million people on the internet today, a billion active phone connections. We sold 161 million smartphones last year. We should get a 70% penetration very soon. So this big jigsaw puzzle coming together is why the next decade is maybe the most interesting in our country's history. Right? So startup ecosystem wise, we're now the third largest startup ecosystem in the world after the US and China. We created $140 billion of value. There are 39,000 startups in the country, mostly concentrated in these five cities. Bangalore sees 43% of total deal value last year. So this city is dominating in terms of money being raised as well. Last year we raised 11 billion. The previous year we raised 13.7. That drop-off effect is because of Walmart acquiring Flipkart. Flipkart hadn't gone over, they would have raised at least three billion. So that's the distribution of companies in the country, and if you're in Bangalore, you're in the best place to be for sure. Next. And these are the unicorns we created. This is the big flywheel. In the last just five years, we raised now 50 billion dollars. 20 unicorns have been created in that same period. There are a total of 33 unicorns right now. All these companies here. They have more than 50 unicorns in the last round we made. Open and a bunch of companies now are on their way to becoming unicorns in the next three to four years if all things go well. We have already close to four decacons, companies that are crossing $10 billion in market cap. Uh, one of our sister funds, RM, was the first investor in Baiju. So we are fortunate enough to see one company scale up on the way to $5 billion from $20 billion in the first round. So we've seen this one cycle happen already. We've seen the next cycle ramp up. It's a very different cycle. These are much higher quality companies, much better quality founders, much more domain expertise, much stronger signals in the market, much easier to get more users if you're on the consumer side, much easier to build integrations on the business side. This cycle is only getting more and more formalized, easier and easier to grow faster and faster. It's a beautifully self-fulfilling flywheel, but that's the effect of how an ecosystem comes together to create value for everyone. So it's a massive, massive achievement for the country. We're very happy that this is getting better and better as things scale forward. And this is some data on unicorns, but 40% of all the unicorns in Bangalore, another 40% in Delhi. Most of the unicorns by sector are e-commerce, consumer, fintech, SaaS, and logistics. We think the next big wave is going to come from SaaS and fintech, which will be slowly growing and taking over from the first wave of consumer tech and e-commerce companies. So if you are looking to build large companies in India, and you ask, you're thinking about which areas, frankly the answer is all areas are supporting the growth. If you want to be in the really high velocity areas, pick the middle, not the first two, but three, four, and five. That's going to see the next big spurt in the next three. Next. Let's come to questions now. Sorry, I didn't give you so much theory, but this laid the foundation for the answers I'd be giving. Uh, next. So the first set of questions I got are on selection. How do we differentiate? How do we evaluate startups? How do we look at business plans? And what are the characteristics of a startup that will succeed? So in typical fashion, I will answer the inverse of the question first, just to sound like I know what I'm talking about. Because if you understand the power law environment that I showed you before, it's very hard to use yesterday's rules to pick tomorrow's winners. That's a fundamental lesson I want to leave behind with you. Even if we make something good happen before, I can't use the same learnings to make it happen again. In fact, I don't want to do the same thing again. I have to intentionally force myself and our team to do something different to make that happen again tomorrow. So keeping that in mind, right? Let's look at what factors contribute to companies having success. Right? The number one 
The number one factor is time. And it's also the least tangible factor of all of these factors. How do you decide if now is the right time to start this idea that you have for the company? Right? But strangely enough, this is actually data and analysis of 200 companies from SV, uh, SV Angel's portfolio in the Valley. The second big uh, contributor, of course, no surprise, is team and execution. It means in spite of the idea you have, more or less most of the time, if you execute well enough, you more or less tend to succeed, you can beat your competition, even if it's not the best idea. The third thing is the idea of truth outlier. What that means very simply is, did you know something about what you were doing that no one else who was doing the same thing knew at that point in time? So a very simple example about timing and truth outlier is if you are a really well accomplished computer scientist, but you are but you are developing the best Pascal compiler in 2019. You are in an unknown, completely invaluable market, but you are the best possible person in that market. Right? So you might make something happen, a Sun Microsystems or Oracle might buy you for a small amount, but you are not going to get a big, big swing because it's the wrong place, the wrong time to be in that place. But when you see the whole first three things play out, it should give you confidence that in spite of not knowing timing, if you are able to do number two and three well, we stand a higher and higher chance and we tend to make these two variables work in our favor. And of course, number four is business model. What that tends to mean is did you figure out pricing better for competition? Did you figure out margins better for competition? Were you able to, able to lower costs before anyone else was able to do that? Those are all the business model advantages. And least of all of these factors is funding. Now, I differ with this because this is a set of parameters that applies to the US. We are not in an environment where we're getting $130 billion of funding every year. So funding really uh, may not be a problem for the you know, the top 500 companies there every year. In India, it's still, it's, it's still a struggle to get a few billion dollars into the country every year, although we're getting 15 to 16 billion dollars comfortably. So I would say in India, funding would definitely be in number three or number four. And because we have so much slack, I would say business model, we actually have more advantages, more scope for innovation than the US. The US is what we would call a peak economy, meaning all the slack in the system, someone's come and already figured it out. There's very little excess left, and the only excess left is on the consumer side. So if you're selling selling to millions of consumers, they will pay seven, eight, nine dollars a month for the same product you have to sell for maybe fifty cents, sixty cents, one dollar a year. So the excess is only on the consumer side. That's why their consumer companies make so much money so much faster, and their excess is on the enterprise side. They have so many of the world's largest buyers in terms of software that they are willing to spend more for a slightly better advantage in their competition. Or slightly more efficiencies inside their organization. So when you have excess, funding is no longer a concern. But in India, because we don't have excess, there's still so much slack to solve, the business model parameter would be much slower. So while all of this sounds nice in theory, putting it into practice is always hard. Like I said, you can't use yesterday's rules for tomorrow's winners. But this should show you some indications of how to think about what VCs look for when they're listening to your pitch. Next. And most importantly, let's talk about you as individuals and the people you are going to be meeting, if you are very clear about why you are doing your startup and what you want out of it. For instance, in your head you are very clear, I want to be known as a guy who made this, I want to make this much money, I want to work with these kind of people because I enjoy being in a challenging environment, and I don't mind being honest about these three things being the most important. If you are very clear about this in a fixed meeting, of course towards the end, don't say that in the beginning, it goes the job. If you say this towards the end, and you're able to create a narrative that shows your motivation and the motivation of the investors and therefore the company are 100% aligned. And it's very clear there's no mystery left. Because what are VCs after? If you ask a VC, why are you doing this and what do you want out of it? We're doing this because you're able to raise money, and we're doing this so that we can generate returns. Those are the only two answers. All the fluffiness about building a nice company, working with great people, they're able to raise money, able to generate, want to generate returns. Those are the only two reasons VCs will do what they do. After they're very extraordinarily successful, then they can focus on, okay, I like this guy, I like that market, I want more equality, more inclusion, all that's nice to have. But this is how they started out, no matter who they are, this country they started out. The same way, when you're a founder or when you're an early employee at a young startup, you have to be very clear about what's very <coughs> important. And if you're able to communicate that very clearly, a pitch is much, much easier to understand, much, much easier to place and therefore decide. Next. This is also very important. One very important 
maybe the most important thing we see in the early stage is that even before you have a product, even before, before you have a track record, if you aren't able to communicate what does success look like, or what will I do to make sure I classify something as a failure, therefore this is how I respond, and I correct and post correct myself, if you aren't able to set clear expectations and agree on success failure standards, it's very hard to build a partnership with you, whether you're on one side of the table or the other. So, for instance, if a VC is confused about whether your pricing should be 600 rupees or 300 rupees, but he will not fund you until you decide, how are you supposed to decide? Even he can't tell you what makes sense, right? So on both sides of the table, everyone must be able to set clearer expectations and agree on what success and failure looks like. That's something that should be part of your pitch, however your pitch goes. Next. Revenue versus growth this is another very, very big challenge. Now, say you raised 100 million dollars, where do you put that money? That's a big question. A lot of those companies on that SUNYCON part of that graph I showed you have to answer before they raise their next one. If they're only going to tell you that I'm raising money because money is coming, that's a terrible answer. No one's going to give you money. But if you have a very clear plan, and after reverse engineering the plan, your plan shows that you need 60 million dollars or 70 million dollars for the next two years, you see a rush of money coming towards you. Because that money has only one motivation. The money is not looking to make, make friends with you. It's not trying to find a nicer person to hang out with. It's not trying to find a place to park. Money has many places to be parked. What money is looking for is coming into something that will grow that money and explode its revenue uh, return generating capacity. So if you are able to show you have a plan that is able to grow that money the best possible way, it is going to be very straightforward for you to raise that money. And that's why the quality of the business plan, this is the only thing people are looking for. Right? And when you raise larger amounts of money and the stakes get higher and higher, in order to survive, because many business models now today unfortunately become reliant on capital, e-commerce is one, full asset logistics is one more, you see dozens of these business models getting more and more money to survive. The growth and revenue balance is what answers that question and determines a lot of startup space. So in the early stage, the stage is not that high yet, but as you grow, the stakes get higher and higher for the answer to this question. Next. And the last thing, of course, is all of us are evaluating how we would build, maintain, and grow shareholder trust. When things go well, I promise you, your shareholders will not give you a single call. Because if a dozen other companies not doing well, that's going to bother them all the time. Right? But when things go badly, and you're a startup founder, an early employee, you have to be able to call your shareholders and rely on them to get you back up to the next level. They're the only people you have, they're the only people you can count on. That's why shareholder is a very intensely generated term. If you look back on the history of shares, we used to be called stocks. We today use the word share. It's because you have a share of whatever's happening in the company. And holder doesn't mean just the monetary value, but also the intrinsic value of the entire organization you bought a piece of. So when you can build that kind of trust, I promise you, if you are that kind of founding team in this country, dozens and dozens of funds will come after you. There is a scarcity of perceived value in every aspect of Indian business today. Give you a very simple example, look at Indian banks, pick the top 20 banks, only one bank is now across 100 billion dollars in market cap. Any answers this one? Of course, and why? Because Mr. Puri, for the last 25 years, nothing has been able to take his focus off of building a high quality business. No amount of risk, no amount of high returns, doesn't matter whose company it is, whose father was his father, whose brother is his brother, he never lent a single rupee to companies people put on a grey list or a black list. Right? And today, after 20 years, this bank is the only bank standing apart from everyone else with very, very, very low energy. So if you are able to be very clear about what kind of person you are, the quality of the organization you want to be a part of, there will be an immediate rush of capital towards you because that is a rare attitude. And that, if you've done that, then you have shareholder trust, becomes a very nice positive feedback loop for yourself and for the shareholders. Next. Second set of questions I received, uh, are there any geographic limitations in these sectors? Uh, I'll, I'll pull up that chart again. Next. So we invest in these five areas. Uh, we invest in these five areas primarily because every aspect of how we see India grow in the next five years, we think in five year cycles, we're seeing that people are going to be spending more and more capital, more and more time. This time becomes the ultimate currency after a certain point in these four areas, whether you're a business or an individual. On the individual side, we believe there are very few business models left that will be able to make solid money. I'll show an example on the B2C side what we did. We also think because of those graphs I showed you, of course, there are many more data points. 
Neither corner is going to be a big space, so that's a very good work here. But our most interesting area so far, because of the business side of things in India and how rapidly it's growing, is FinTech and Enterprise Automation. Uh, we focus on these two areas fundamentally because, as people ourselves, our experience is in, is in those areas. We built large products before, we sold to large enterprise uh, customers. But more importantly, after we survey all the big buyers of software in India today, we've understood how procurement works. We reverse engineered how they buy specific products and services. We find that there's a maturity, how they're thinking about pricing. So long story short, all that sounds nice. But we invest in these four areas because we believe we can build very strong businesses there with the right teams, in the right spaces, with the right markets. We're very specific about what we'll invest in in the first four areas. Because we can do these four reasonably well. We can take selective bets in deep tech. And why do we do deep tech? Deep tech is fundamentally a simple way of saying it's not going to make any money for the first three to five years. Because it takes three to five years to take some idea, some IP that you have and productize it to a point where it's actually usable. It's a very simple example. Uh, you might have heard of bug works, but it's a huge problem in the world today. You have 40 species of superbugs, drug resistant bacteria for which there is no cure. You get infected by a superbug today and we take you to a hospital. We can't give you anything to make it better. So today, 2.5 million people are dying every year of superbug infections, and most of them are getting those superbugs in the hospital environment. We use so much drugs, so many cleaners in hospitals today, that the bacteria have evolved resistance to all the drugs that we use on an everyday basis. So if your grandparents, for instance, will tend to get sicker in the hospital and getting better today, if they go to the wrong hospital. It's very scary stuff. So when we met the bug works team and we understood the scale of the problem, he said, yes, we can take four years to build a solution out the right way, with the right people, because now is the time. And thankfully, these guys have the world's first broad spectrum superbug antibiotic. Their one cabinet can take out 40 out of those 40 species. It's in phase one human trials today. If it comes out after four years, if it works, big spike in value, we should make some money. But more importantly, something important got fixed. So we can do something like that, because as a portfolio, across those 20 companies I showed you, we have some companies already making some signs of the 10x already. So we have to balance out our portfolio. In fact, no VC will do this, but we think about all the problems we can go after, how much returns we can make, who we can work with, and then analyze how much risk we can take on the deferred revenue side. So the portfolio is very intensely constructed, but uh, that's how we decide. We invest primarily in India, uh, very little in the US, because we find that the US India bridge is reasonably stable, uh, in spite of Trump and whatever might happen, but usually to our advantage. Uh, so in the long term, we, we expect this bridge between US and India to be the most reliable for us as a country going forward. Uh, next. And finally, what are some common mistakes in pictures? What are the key elements of the perfect pitch? I'll answer this with very simple examples. Next. Uh, now, uh, Ron Conway, I'm so sure some of you have heard of him. Uh, he runs something called SV Angel. It's a very successful angel group in the US. I think they've got around 20 unicorns coming out of that group. Uh, I am far too early in the VC journey to tell you this is exactly the formula for a successful pitch. Till date, I've never seen a formula in a successful pitch. Like I said, we've always seen something that stood out to us because we were doing a bunch of work on yesterday's problems that suddenly became a timing issue for today. And that's a model we think is going to work. So if you want to look for a basic hygiene risk of what goes into a good pitch, I'm happy to say that there are dozens of these risks all over the place. Everything from great team to chemistry to IP to elevator pitch. I mean, honestly, we don't want an elevator pitch. We want you to spend an hour with us, patiently tell us what you're actually building. That's the only way to start a good relationship. But a lot of these rules exist. Uh, I'll leave it to the experts to tell you what makes a good pitch. But fundamentally, from our point of view, if you know the space you're going after, you can answer the question on timing. You can show us what you're going to build that's a little bit better than the other ideas out there to have our attention. Is that what it, that's what it takes to get started in the early stage. Building a good team after that, building more domain expertise, finding partners, that's our job. We have to help you do that. So we're not expecting, expecting you to come with 100% of the answers in the first place. But we do want to rely on your domain expertise, your understanding of the market, your ability to build a good product or a service, and your ability to understand for yourself why you'll be better. That's something that we can't replace, which is why we look for that in Next. Then, uh, what's been your most challenging experience as a VC? Actually, this, I, there are some things I can't tell you because this is being streamed on Facebook. I will tell you this once that video camera is off. Uh, happy to share some of my worst experiences uh, and the best exit strategies. I clung these two because I think it's the same answer for both. 
it's a politically correct answer, so I can talk about it. A uh, slide. I'll just give you a very simple example. This is one of the first companies we funded. Uh, it's a company called Vicious. If you meet me, if you're a non vegetarian, you probably heard of these guys. Um, it doesn't matter what they do, they're up 82 times for us in value since we first invested. So most companies are lucky if they're a 10x company. Most funds are lucky if they have one, one 10x company. Uh, we are getting hopefully better at playing the 1 to 100x game. And we're very happy to be working with the quality of founders here. What I wanted to show you with this slide is that in spite of, you know, whatever you might think, whatever we showed you in terms of math, this country is today supporting some massive, massive value opportunity. You can build terrific companies in this country if you build it the right way, the right kind of people, the right approach. Right? And in spite of us doing a lot of work with these guys, I will give full credit to the founders because they are the ones who decided that this is the market, this is the right timing, this is the right approach. That's something we didn't expect. We were completely stunned when we got their first fix. But between them and us, what we can tell you is that if you do it right, this game is becoming easier and easier to do over time. So I want to answer that question about what's your biggest challenge by telling you that the rewards of going through those challenges are worth it. If you can do even one of these, and hopefully you can do four or five of these, hopefully all of you can be part of something like this. Uh, it's worth doing, you can build massive value. And this is something that we create as a generational idea. A generational idea is basically an idea that defined that generation of innovation. So Intel was a generation idea, and Apple was a generation idea, Google was a generation idea. You know, Facebook became a generation idea. There are no generational ideas in India yet. Baiju is close, Flipkart is close, KTM may be there, Oyo might be there. But there are hundreds of ideas that can support generational companies. We believe that's the right answer and that's why everything is worth it. All the challenges you face, all the nonsense you have to go through every day, it's going to be worth it. Uh, next. So I think that's everything I prepared for. It was all the questions that were sent my way. Happy to open up the floor and answer more questions. Thanks, Pat. We've been standing for a while. I'm going to pass the mic now for uh, questions. Raise your hand. Hi, Pranav. This is Prashant here. So, in one of your slides, I've seen that there are top five factors. One of them was timing, it is very important. For any startup or an early stage who raises funds, they see timing as an issue for them to get funded, like it's take 8 months to 10 months or probably 12 months. But when they come down, like they need the funds then, that's the right time for them. It takes 8 months to 10 months then down the line. Isn't it a contrary? So, I'll tell you why timing becomes an issue from, there are two aspects of timing. Timing is, is this the right time to start? Versus how much time it takes to actually raise the money and actually get started, right? Uh, I'll answer the second question first. Uh, you should know that it takes between two to three years for a VC fund typically to raise its entire fund. Uh, we can do one every year because we, I mean, we spent a decade getting good at it. But most funds take two to three years per fund. Now, if they took two to three years to raise one fund, can we apply a different standard to them when it comes to investing in companies? Right? So it doesn't. I mean, I'm not surprised that it takes so long to fundraise. In fact, with, with 50 companies we've done, almost all of them have raised one more round after us. Even part of the struggle, we've seen how hard it is to fundraise. Uh, my simple pointer to that is, again, there is more money today than good companies to invest in. So if you are able to crack a specific answer in a way no one else has in that space before, I promise you, there are, there are enough investors who come saying, why am I not part of them? Why haven't we spoken to so you have to figure out from your side what it's going to take to get your company to stand out that much better. It's not going to be better press, it's not going to be a nicer site, it's not going to be a better looking logo. Those things are all nice, they, they matter, I promise you they matter. But it's going to be about answer those questions differently. And that's why I think your measure or metric of have you answered it correctly is how long it's taking you to get that term sheet. Right? And you should use that as a feedback loop. If it's taking longer, so for instance, you had a great meeting with VC Fund A, right? but then it trailed off. It might not have been as good a meeting as you thought. Maybe they're just being polite. Right? But if you had a really good meeting and they're serious about investing, you see they start chasing you. Can I get this MIS? Can I get this? Yes. 
and I get that uh, an answer to this point in the margin, right? You see that engagement ramping up quicker and quicker than you can answer questions. That's when you know the answering questions correctly. So you have to be able to understand the game you're playing. It's a two-way dynamic complex system, right? Every every fundraise is is easily classified that way. So I, I think you can play that very well. And I have seen best founders, you know, and, and of course the open team, I must congratulate them on how they raised. They've been able to understand how to position a company very clearly, make it very simple to understand, and that much more powerful as well. So I think that's a very good live example of how we can do it right. But yes, I am upset that it takes nine months to get close around. My life would be easier if it took less time, even for the companies we are funding for the first time. But uh, that's the nature of the market today. I think it should get better over time, for sure. On the other timing question, timing is 2020 only in hindsight. I can tell you today, for instance, I'm very happy we did this. Is. Because today I know it's a 100, 100x company. I promise you, in 2015, we have no idea if this space is going to support a brand like this. It's still a very controversial area. Right? But you look at every single company that's gotten big, even Baiju. He started out as a guy, a phenomenal teacher, writing the IIM every year and getting 99.8%. Right? He does it for three years. He goes to a parent and he says, I can teach your kid because I wrote the exam last year and I cracked it. That's a much more powerful sell. In an NIIT or any of those the thousands of coaching academies trying to market and convincing you to send your kid there, right? You have to figure out that you can sometimes create your own timing and you use what you created as a reason for the other person across the table to believe this is the right time. So you, there are ways to gain both sides, the amount of time it takes and now the right time. But how you do it is completely special. Hello, uh, my name is Sanjay. Uh, do you see any of your portfolio companies doing an IPO in India uh, anytime soon? So, if I mean, are there any uh, regulatory challenges towards doing uh, so? Very good question. Um, if, so, before we answer that for ourselves, the first thing we did was work very closely with everyone who manages the IPO ecosystem, right? The market makers, the book builders. Sometimes even the investors, and of course, uh, regulators and everyone else. And after five years of our team constantly doing it, I can guarantee you it has gotten much easier to list today than even two years back. I think the new exchanges and the new norms that SEBI is easing out is making it easier and easier for Indian companies to list here. The Indian government is terrified of our best companies leaving the country. It is bad for everyone, and they know that it is bad for India. Our regulators are even more afraid of losing the best companies. Than to the NASDAQ or to Singapore before they list her. So they're actually making it easier and easier for us to list. The India Mart IPO was a big success, I think 36 times over subscribed. We think that's the first of many to come. And from our portfolio, we're certainly preparing at least three companies to be able to list the next four to five years. But we will keep them private for long. It's not taken up. I think it was misused. Uh, I think a lot of uh, what I would call premature companies use that as a quick way to exit. I think an IPO is the worst place to go if you want to do a quick exit. So these are you know, powerful, historically very well entrenched shareholders. You can't pull the wool over their eyes and they don't look at risk the same way VC does. So we have to use the markets the correct way. It's not just a dumping ground for our worst idea. So you have to, you have to understand how to go IPO. I think that, that's, that's on our side, not on the market side. First and foremost, thank you so much for the thank you. So, uh, the question that I have is more personal rather than appealing to a very large cross section of everybody sitting yeah. because I don't want to be e commerce company. Yeah. So, coming to that point of you know, either the timing is right or you create the point with the timing. I love that point. And how do I want to use it to my advantage rather than that B2B e commerce? Yeah. B2B is now the keyword, the buzzword along with fintech is what I've noticed okay. and heard from everyone. Sure. So, that's the reason I'm asking this question is that. How do you personally see B2B companies' valuations working and what are the top three or five metrics that you see in uh, such valuations going forward? So when I'm not on camera talking, I'll give you the side I can't say on camera. On camera, I will tell you, yes, uh, we have now gone through a cycle within a cycle of B2C where dozens of companies have raised large amounts of money. You can argue e-commerce is B2C, Uber was B2C, uh, WeWork was B2B, B2C, we are, we are uh, cross-link. But now that one cycle within a cycle is over, and before the cycle plays out and starts going down, 
you'll see a shift towards less risky companies but growing faster. So B2B is a perfect combination. SaaS is the perfect VC model because it does three things very well. It gives you predictability. It helps you make costs elementary. For every new customer, I will spend this much and I hope to make this much. That will be to cap, right? And third, very importantly, it gives the market predictability. If they have grown at 30% every quarter in the last three years, we can give them more money to help them grow now, 45% per quarter, if we do A, B, C, D. It's easy to answer the question, right? But so if customers have to keep giving them discounts, keep spending, it's not a reliable, sustainable business model. So I think B2B, when B2B becomes a flavor, the cycle within the cycle is over, and now we're going towards the end cycle, kind of slowly slowing off. Uh, so now's a good time to be B2B. However, uh, multiples will squash off. Because when VCs know that, okay, now B2B is becoming easier to fund and easier to get the next round for, I should squash price down and then get price up. So you see multiples, the range of multiples getting wider and wider. You should not be surprised with a 5x multiple on annual revenues, not be surprised with a 20x multiple on annual revenues. Because that's the range when people are buying and figuring out how to pump it to sell. Because best sellers will get a high multiple, the worst sellers will get a very low multiple. Yeah, difficult. That's that's when they will even need Yeah, I think the typical I think the typical life cycle of a company today is seven to eight years before it's IP already. It's a very generalized. I don't like generalizing, but. Uh, Bootstrap, right? Bootstrap. They didn't see a value in uh, going to a VC. VC. Does it even work, or is it like ten years is too old? And I, I, I think is too old? I can give you the flip side of that um, because I can't answer that question. It may not work every time. Uh, if you took ten years to figure out what works and what works, the definition of works meaning it's VC growth compliant, right? Then uh, the VC will ask you, okay, maybe you know what? You're not the best guys for this idea. Thank you for the idea. We'll give it to this company, they're just starting off. I'm going to send their deck, I can sign an NDA, and make them grow from your zero, and I can do the eight year growth, right? You, that's a flip side of taking 10 years to figure something out. I would say you have to be careful about what market you're building and how you answer that question. I have seen eight year companies raise. In fact, I think Visa just funded one a couple of, yeah, a couple of days back. So I do know that there is tolerance for that. There's a lot of rationale to accept it. I don't think it's a generalizable tool. But you should know the flip side. Once you funded a company, how do yeah. you know that you know market is working? More money. Yeah. Let it die. Let it die. Let it die is not our decision. Uh, actually, it's a very very difficult decision. Uh, so far, all the mortalities we've seen, I think the founder is the first person to initiate that discussion, saying, "Look, we founding team will say that we firmly believe we haven't we run out of ideas, right? Um, we can't pull that trigger because." On a 20 scale portfolio, like I showed you, right? We are expecting a certain mortality rate. So, if, I, if we start killing our companies earlier, <laughs> then that's actually killing the expected returns of our portfolio. So, it's wrong to ask a fund that. Uh, we certainly are not the decision makers on that. We work very hard with the founders to make sure we understand all the parameters before that decision is made. But kill it now or later, right? Uh, so, I think that's the right way to, again, work with shareholders you trust. They will figure out an answer with you. It's not just one person's decision. That's the best way to think about it. This is nice to on a B2B SaaS. So when it comes to SaaS, you know, keep talking about religion in India and selling in the US. Is that your reflection too? I know no target box is not yet. You know, Focusing on the US rather on the Asia. So, Asia, SaaS versus uh, global virtual. Yeah, I think a lot of success has happened with the global delivery model. And I spoke about the IT uh, companies. So, just think about it. If you are starting a fund today and you, you survey the market, and historically that has made a lot of returns. You were a shareholder in three, and they gave you 3,700x per year. So, crazy returns. Um, it's very hard for a market that's already done it once 
to, to admit to itself that now we should try doing something else. Darwin Box, for instance, good example. I think they've done extremely well to figure out how to tell the market an Indian SaaS company can solve an India problem for Indian clients better than our global competition that doesn't look at India as a primary. And you can see the rate of customer onboarding has proved that yes, Indian Indian companies who have historically not liked to work with Indian products before are buying Indian products now to solve these problems. Because they, they understand being ignored by non-India players is becoming a big part of their lack of efficiency. Right? So I think if you're in the right space, increasingly I spoke about speaking to procurement also, I think their mindsets have changed. They are willing to take more longer term bets with Indian products and build out something together that works for all sides. So my my understanding of Indian SaaS would be India SaaS market is opening up. I think some markets are still too early, so I would not go there right now. Uh, if you've done it before and you think you can build a global company out of India, I don't see why you wouldn't do it again. So both channels are open, but I think you should think about where you are and what your company is. Certainly we've seen both work. You should look at exits. Right? So, so, so when you see a company, we've already mapped its exit yeah, point. And uh, and do you as a as a VC fund invest in companies which might not be ideal worthy, but it might still create some value and yeah. a good returns for the VC. Got it. So the simplest way to answer that, sir, is generally VC will invest in anything that will tell the VC that this will make money. How we will make money is the next question to answer. So I'll answer the how. Assuming we have something that makes money. Uh, we think that there's there's a lot of friction that's been removed in India over the last even three years. I think for instance, although taxation has become slightly higher, which is a problem. Uh, other aspects of how to get money out, how to make sure you have a secondary market that can answer the question of where tax should be paid first, can global companies come and buy secondaries, all of those answers are finally been met. So we're actually expecting a very interesting data point is the next 12 months, there is an expectation of $2.5 billion of VC exits only in second year. Any other funds coming and buying our shares in the company beyond. It's not an IPO or not an acquisition, it's a secondary exit. So we think that is when a market shows you that the full cycle is complete. You have grown enough valuable companies, they are able to get acquired and give you an exit, they are able to go IPO and give you an exit, or other funds outside are saying, I want to now own this company, will you sell a piece of the company to me? That's a secondary exit. So when all three happen, then you can comfortably say the ecosystem is as mature as it's required to be. We think we reach that stage. We think this year will be a defining year of secondary. So finally the world will see that's happening in India. Uh, and I think that is how we will plan our exits as well. We are very clear we want to hold on to our best companies for as long as possible. So one challenge I talk about off camera is the last question I was going to answer on camera is how we manage to not get bullied off capital. That's a big challenge. Because when you say you have a 10x company or whatever, another challenge starts, everyone now wants a piece of it. The company doesn't need more money, so everyone starts bullying you to sell. Right? So how do you how do you deal with that situation? So we see the whole 360 happen and that's how we think about it. We think it's definitely getting easier to predict how to exit and Yes, the answer is yes. I showed you the data. Yeah, so I showed you the data set of uh, all percentages as, as far as venture is concerned. Typically, 60% of all companies fail. So it's a very, very high rate, very high. Rate. So that's it applies to early stages. Uh, failure, not always, but uh, as VCs ourselves. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So we actually, before we invest, we at least we try every time if we can. There's enough time. As long as sometimes close too quickly. Once that previous question was not always nine months. Sometimes it's two weeks. Um, what we try to do is build tolerances in. 
to understand from the founder's perspective what might happen to not make you meet the plan. Right? So success failure standards. What happens when things are suddenly going faster than we expect? You might have to raise much earlier. You might have to hire much more people. An office space might become suddenly redundant. So uh, we have to be able to understand both ends of that spectrum. So we do that and whether we do it before the investment or right after, that depends on the timing. But uh, we certainly have to do that. And as far as we are concerned, the best founders we know will tell us they're doing it before we ask them the question. Shareholder trust, a big part of that trust is earned. My founder is telling you in advance, okay, I'm going faster than expected or slower than expected. Here's why, and here's what I'm going to fix. And then your role as a VC is only, can I help you do it better? That's the only question to ask.